Hey, uh, let's give Mike a real welcome. It's going to be great this morning. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> That's so funny. Not often I hear angry notices, you know. <laughs> the contrast is immense. I felt deeply loved when, when Pat was sharing those notices. I feel like I want to come to lunch, you know. <laughs> oh, dear. What a joy. Isn't it great that we can just be ourselves in the house of God and just, you know, don't have to put up any front and be something we're not. So uh, great to be here and uh, great to be in the church with you and friendly faces and people that I know and, and uh, I mean, a great journey, you know, and, 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 and on that journey, a lot of stuff happens, you know, churches go through change and we've gone through our changes and whatever, but I just love that, uh, that, uh, that Brent just keeps that fire for the Holy Ghost and keeps championing that we keep hungry and open for God. I think that's just really amazing. Okay, well, we're looking at freedom and... Uh, uh, there's a whole range of areas we could look at in the area of freedom, but uh, I want to pick at one that's, uh, that I think is an important one. I'll tell you why I think it's so important, apart from the fact that there's no place I go where it isn't a problem. No place I go where it's not a problem. And uh, when I used to go to Asia years ago, the predominant problem that we would face would be the spiritism in the family backgrounds, idolatry and uh, fortune telling and occultic stuff and so on. And uh, it was like that. That was the predominant problem. And so I'd have to nail that one first. But uh, over the years, I noticed it, there's been a shift. And uh, as another generation arises up, they, probably the, the one that is the, the one that keeps coming up and is the one that seems to be impacting so many lives is the one we're going to share on today. And I want to talk on the issue of bitterness, the spirit of bitterness. And, uh, because people don't usually realize they're bitter because they don't feel bitter. But there are evidences of it. And, and I want to help you just understand it. And uh, as we're going to look, we'll, we'll, we're going to look in the Old Testament. I want to start there. I want to go to uh, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. I thought about this quite a bit, and uh, I felt the Holy Spirit uh, just talk to me and impress me on me some things related to this. And so rather than just teach it straight from the New Testament, I want to just look into the Old Testament because uh, you'll see the significance of it in a moment. It says Moses, verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 22. Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went into the wilderness of Shur, and they, found, and they went three days in the wilderness, but found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could, they could not drink the waters of Marah because they were bitter. That's why the name of it was called Marah, meaning bitter waters. And the people complained against Moses. So here you see one of the first evidences of bitterness is, is how people respond in difficulties. And uh, it says then, uh, and they complained, saying, what do we drink? And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and when he cast it into the waters, then the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statute and ordinance with them and tested them. So notice this is a testing, or not a test pass-fail, it's a test to prove or examine what is in someone's life. Eh? That word there is to, to, to try and examine the quality or the, to inspect what is in someone's life. So that's the purpose of this. And this is engineered by God. And uh, the Lord said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, uh, do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I'll put none of the diseases on you which I put upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water, 70 palm trees, and they camped there by the waters. Now, there's a tremendous amount in this passage, and I'll just open up and share some things that I've seen, just the insights I've seen. The first thing, uh, as, as we look at it, is you've got to get the context for this. And uh, this is the first challenge that the people of God have after they come out of Egypt. So we recognize prophetically that to be living in Egypt is the life without Christ. They were living under taskmasters. They were living in slavery and bondage, and they suffered for 400 years. Their suffering was immense. They endured all kinds of things. So this is a generation that have not got a background of freedom. This is a generation that have emerged out of years of being oppressed and abused and suffering. If you read through in, the, uh, in, the, in Exodus chapter 1, you find out about some of the things that happened. 
uh, you find that the male children were all murdered. You find out that the people were oppressed and said they cried an exceedingly bitter cry to the Lord. So the background to the story is that the people of God have suffered abuse, they've suffered slavery, they've been in bondage, they've suffered the loss of children, they've been traumatized, and knowing the nature of slavery, no doubt the women on a fairly extensive base had been abused sexually and violently. So this is the background. We tend to read the stories and we kind of read it through a nice sort of a, a religious haze rather than sort of seeing these people have suffered immensely. They had to work long hours. Their returns were very poor. They, they just suffered. And it said there was an exceedingly bitter cry came up to the Lord. And it says the Lord heard their cry. And when he got, hears the cry of people, his response is to send someone to set them free. That's a whole message of its own, that when God sees a generation in bondage, he looks to raise up people who he can send to deliver them and set them free. So Moses brought them out of captivity, and we understand that they, 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 there was the slaying of the lamb and the shedding of blood, uh, and they escaped out of the captivity. We remember they went through the Red Sea or the waters, which is the equivalent of water baptism. They came under the cloud, which is the equivalent of spirit baptism. So the prophetic picture here is people who suffered a life uh, of sin and slavery, had been rescued out and when they were saved, water baptized under the Holy Ghost. And the very first thing that God does is bring them to the waters of Marah. He brings them to a place that uncovers something deep inside their lives. And uh, the purpose of this is not to defeat them or frustrate them or to just be mean to them. The purpose of this is to expose what lies in the heart so God can bring healing to it. God's always a God of restoration. He's always looking how he can restore us. So it's interesting to me that the very first issue that he addressed with them is the issue of bitterness in the heart, the bitterness of what they've suffered over many years. So although they've escaped the slavery, the impact of the slavery still is in the heart. Their lives are still suffering because of what they've gone through. And so that's why we want to look at this. And I have found that bitterness is a great problem. It's a... Who was that? Not me, this is my phone. Here, dingy. <laughs> so let's have a look at bitterness. And I want to go through the story here. Now you notice also, just as we, before we get into teach about it, you notice that God already had a provision over here. He already had wells, he had trees, palm trees, so he had a place of rest, he had a place of provision. He had it all planned. It was just outside their immediate view. So when you look at it from God's perspective, God had not caused them to suffer, but prior to his great provision, he just wanted to bring something up in their lives. And the purpose of bringing them up in their lives is to develop faith in God so they can enter an inheritance. So I have discovered that this is a significant problem for many people, but they don't really realize it. So let's have a look and just, just share some things just on bitterness. I want to look at bitterness, what bitterness is, how it develops in people's life, because it's something that develops, and then it has certain fruit. It has things that it shows up in people's lives. And as I describe some of the fruit, you may realize, oh, wow, Oh, I know someone like that. You know. <laughs> I know someone like that. So we read in Hebrews 12 and verse 15. Hebrews 12 verse 15, very familiar passage. Hebrews 12 and verse 15, and uh, it's talking then again about our journey. Hebrews 12 is about sonship and God disciplining us for maturity. And then in the midst of it all, he just raises up this thing here. He said, having talked about being trained by the Lord, then he says, verse 14, pursue peace Without, uh, with all people and holiness without which uh, no one will see the Lord, being careful or being diligent, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So notice now, he says that bitterness is a poisonous root that grows in the heart. So it's not something you see, it's not something visible, but it does have a fruit but it's something that develops in the heart. It is a root 
So even if you try to change the behaviors, if you don't deal with the root in the heart and pull the root out, if it's not actually extracted from the heart and something else put in its place, then the thing just keeps producing fruit again. And uh, it produces, uh, as we'll see, certain kinds of fruit. So as we look there, it says, that it says it will defile or contaminate relationships. So I've observed over many, many years certain things happening in churches. Now, church is just a community of people who are on a journey. And so if we don't deal with bitterness, whenever there's a pressure comes, the bitterness will come up. And it'll come up and show in certain kinds of ways that contaminates the people around. And I've realized over watching many, many things that have happened in church that frequently people are contaminated by the bitterness of someone else and they leave the very place God placed them and fall out of the destiny they have for God. God places us in a house, places us in a church, draws us to a ministry because it's part of shaping us for our destiny. So if it takes God quite a lot of effort to set us into a house, we should never leave because something upset us. We should never leave because we're offended. We should never leave by reaction. If we're going to depart, it always needs to be by revelation. So on, in, the, in the course of my life, I've made a number of transitions and changes, but always by revelation. I, I would be afraid of the, of the consequences if God positioned me and I abandoned the position because I got upset by something someone did. I'd never be confident now I'm ever in the right positioning again because I abandoned the one God put me in. So it's like God puts us, positions us in a family and there'll be things happen on the journey. Things that can offend us, things that can upset us, things that can disappoint us. There's things happen on the journey and, and our job is to guard our heart and our behavior, how we treat or how we respond in the midst of these things. If there is bitterness, a hardship will flush it up. And sadly, as we'll see so frequently, that when people are bitter, they don't just keep it to themselves, they spread it to other people. So over the years in doing counseling and marriage and working in church, I have seen that bitterness is a poisonous root that defiles relationship. It defiles the marriage. It poisons the marriage with hard feelings. And uh, it poisons the family, the children, and so then it produces cycles of failure in people's lives. In churches, I find that people get defiled rather than actually resolving what issue they need to face. So I've, one of the things I learned about that, if it's not my responsibility, don't hold an opinion about it. Just pray and hold your position. See, what happens is we get drawn in to someone's defilement and they want us to come into agreement with their defilement, agreement with their issue. Now, God will always give whatever thing we face, God will give us grace to handle it. And so you notice here, it says the reason bitterness springs up is because instead of choosing to draw near for God's enabling power to walk through it and stay sweet, instead, we progress down into bitterness. So whenever difficulties happen in life, disappointments happen in life, setbacks happen in life, unexpected things happen in life, and some of them are actually permitted by God to bring up what already sits in our heart. Not to defeat us, but to help us see this is what you're carrying. This is how you're reacting. Look what you're doing in the midst of the difficulty. And this is your opportunity now to be healed and be restored. So when God took them... He took them to the bitter waters. He took them to situations where it was not sweet, it was bitter, not for the point of overthrowing them, but for giving them the opportunity to find him as the healer and find grace to overcome. So when you face challenges in life, disappointments in life, setbacks in life, what is your immediate response? Is it to complain and be overwhelmed or is it to find God and find grace? <laughs> challenging, isn't it? Eh? Challenging to think about those things. Eh? So it says, notice here, it says that many be defiled. Many be defiled. Many. So this is not a little thing. In fact, we find that the majority of people became defiled so deeply that that generation weren't able to enter what God had promised them because bitterness was sitting in their heart. So I've tried to, in the difficulties we're faced in life, and we face them in our personal lives, we face them in family, we face them in the church, 
face them in a whole number of different ways. One of the things I've tried to do is to keep my heart soft and free of offense. So no matter what anyone did, it won't define my life. You make sense to you? Don't let someone else's actions define your choices in your life. You must become responsible for your choices and choose God's way, which is always the way of grace. Grace means to give you favor and empower you so you can rise above the difficult situation. Okay, so let us, so he says there, be diligent, or he says, uh, looking carefully or being extremely diligent, lest any of you. So it's possible for any of us, when we face a provocation, a disappointment, an upset, to let go of God's ability to help and become enmeshed in the emotions and the difficulty we're facing. Marriages, families, dramas of all kinds. I'm amazed how many people just quit and give up because they went through a hard time rather than staying the course and finishing well. I purposed I will finish well. I have no intention of falling in the wilderness like I've seen many do because something happened and they were overthrown by what happened. Not overthrown by God, not overthrown by the devil, overthrown because instead of reaching out for God's help and finding the the, the power of the Spirit to overcome, they allowed it to defile them and sink them. And uh, I've watched it. See, in a small city, no one gets away. You kind of see where they go and what happens to them, and and you can watch them over the journey. And it's been so disappointing to see people that once were strong in God, passionate in God, and now there's nothing. There's just like a dullness. And it's not just them. You see their children now no longer in the things of the Spirit and walking in God. That the parents being overthrown affected the family as well. And the whole legacy of godliness gets lost. It's huge, huge impact for this. Huge impact for this. So it's, it is a, what I consider a massive problem. And as I say, when I'm counseling people, it is the, probably the number one issue now that arises that people are struggling with. And we have to help them to deal with and to get over Okay, so, so how does bitterness develop? It, it, does, it develops. It doesn't just arrive. It is a root that develops in a person's life. And it's got evidence of it. And, and it progresses something like this. Someone gets hurt. Whenever you get hurt, you usually feel angry. <laughs> Don't do that to me. You know, well, that's what people, it's normal to feel angry when we get hurt or disappointed or set back. Something happens that we didn't expect or that we get, we get a setback of some kind. Uh, we get angry. And then... If we don't resolve the anger, the Bible says it's okay to be angry. It's all right to feel angry. It says in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, be angry but don't sin. And then don't go to bed being angry. So it actually says it's okay to feel angry, (laughs) but don't sin. In other words, don't explode and yell at everyone and hurt them all, and then you feel better and they're devastated. And don't internalize it and go all quiet and get angry inside and seethe. Is something wrong? No. Whoa. You can feel the vibes of anger, you know. So, and it says don't go to bed angry. In other words, it gives you a space of a day to resolve the issue by finding the grace of God to forgive the person who hurt you. It's very simple. Forgive. Let it go. Tell someone next to you, just let it go. Don't hold on. He says, so if we hold on, then offense comes. Now, offense means we wall our heart because we're feeling hurt. And people in church do that. The Kiwis do that very lot. We hold an offense in. Someone says, is something wrong? Nope. <laughs> we, we just deny it. Just We lie. <laughs> Pretend that everything's okay. And you know it's not because now the person's quite distant from you. The Bible says offenses are like a wall that keeps you out. So you felt... Man, I know that we were close and now there's a distance. Something has happened. We're not stupid. You know, when you know that you're flowing with someone and you're connected to someone and now they're reserved and they spoke to that person and now they're reserved, you know there's an issue. They've picked up someone else's offense. It's sitting in their heart as an offense and now they're holding offense in the heart. Now, if we don't resolve offense in the heart, we start to develop resentment. We be- See, it's a progression we become resentful that this person is like this or this issue is like that. And then once you're offended, that's all you see. You don't see good qualities. You actually see, it just annoys me that I see, I'm kind of annoyed. And then we become resentful about it. Then that's when bitterness develops. But it doesn't stop there. Bitterness, if it's left unchecked, develops into hatred and a desire for revenge. 
Now get this, in the Chinese culture, they have a proverb. Now interesting, because proverbs reflect kind of common accepted things that happen, you know, it's like a saying. And, uh, and uh, you know, so here's the, here's the saying they have in the, in the Chinese culture, 10 years is not too long to wait for revenge. How about that? Now what does that tell you about how people deal with offenses? What it tells you, because it's a proverb, means this is a saying about how people behave. And so the common expectation is that people won't forgive, they won't address it, they'll bury it and hold it back. And later, t- years later, when you have no idea, suddenly they get back. And you think, whoa, what was all of that? Imagine he's sitting on, on revenge for 10 years, just waiting for the chance to pay back. Now, that happens. That's, that's the progression of it. So when you understand the progression of it, it, suddenly you'll understand why it is that people suddenly erupt with weird stuff. It's because they've been sitting on it for a long time. A root of bitterness has developed in the heart. And it can be bitterness against men, can be bitterness against women, can be bitterness against authorities, can be a bitterness over money, can be a bitterness towards life, can be bitterness towards God. There can be many root ways that bitterness develops, but it's always a sour thing inside people. So bitterness is, is, is horrendous. And there's a whole number of examples in the Bible. I'll just throw them out without looking them up. Just, but you, you, you remember, uh, you'll find different people in the Bible who became bitter instead of drawing from God the grace to change. It's always the choice. You always have a choice. You have no choice what someone else does, but you have the choice how you respond. If you want to be a powerful person and a free person, choose to draw from God and respond in a godly way. If you want to become a victim, then react to what's happening to you and blame that person. See, so we've always got the choice of how we're going to respond. There's always a choice what you can do. You have power to choose over your life. So I've chosen, I will not let others' crazy stuff defile me and cause me to become bitter and angry and grow old and sour. I'm not going to do that. I refuse to do it. I refuse to do that. I choose to, to be responsible for how I respond. And, and, and if you were here, well, we shared a little bit about uh, the whole issue of identity as a son of God or a child of God. Because I'm a child of God, I don't do that stuff. I do this stuff. We forgive like our Father forgives. So you live out of identity rather than reaction. Now, many of you will be living out of reaction. You get hurt and you react, hurt and react, and then a storm grows in the marriage and the relationships rather than being, taking ownership, deal with the hurt, and then choose to behave differently. So you, here's a few examples in the Bible. Uh, it, for example, in Genesis uh, 4, 6, it tells us that Cain, because Cain experienced rejection, and then he became angry, and then what did he do? Hatred grew in his heart. He was bitter about what had happened, and eventually he retaliated, killed his brother. See, what, what caused that? Well, he was rejected, and he let the rejection cause him to become bitter instead of changing. So when you get hurt, like he got hurt, God said to him, sin lies at the door. You can rule over it. So when you get hurt, sin is waiting to capture you. You choose what you do with it or not. No? Here's another one. Uh, what about Esau? Remember Esau? Esau, uh, his brother came and sneaked in, disguised himself as the older brother and, and got the blessing from the father. And it said when Esau found out the blessing had gone, it says he wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. He was bitter that he had not got his father's blessing. So what did he do? It says he comforted himself. So you've got two ways of comforting yourself. You can either comfort yourself in God and find release in him, or you have another way. It says he comforted himself, planning to kill his brother when his father died. And you notice how frequently at the funeral, all the stuff starts to come up. Because the governing authority is gone, And now the family issues emerge. Bitterness. Deep, bitter feelings. Unresolved feelings have been there for years. And uh, so what he planned, he planned to kill his brother because he felt unfairly treated. So for Cain, it was rejection. But for Esau, he he suffered an injustice. His brother stole what really he was entitled to, and he was really unhappy about that. But instead of dealing with it, he planned to get revenge. 
Okay, it's another example, uh, and that is, uh, we've seen the example of Israel. What about Naomi? Now, Naomi in Ruth chapter 1, verse 20, she said, Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, call me bitter, because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Now, remember, she left Israel with her husband. They had two sons, and the two sons married. Then the husband died, and then both sons died. So she suffered the loss of family, and her reaction is to blame God. The Lord has done this to me. So many people, when they're angry and hurt, they become bitter against God. So you try to talk to them about the Lord, then their bitterness comes up immediately. Angry reactions about God. So she became bitter towards God to the point where she wanted to be even renamed. You think about uh, Hannah in 1 Samuel 1.10. She wept bitterly in the presence of the Lord. Uh, Her dream of having a child, which meant everything to her, seemed to be taken away from her and the other wife was having all these children so she comparing herself became very bitter inside but she chose to overcome it she chose to surrender to the Lord and out of that place of surrender then she had a huge blessing of many children come to her so uh, Proverbs 5 verse 3 and 4 Proverbs 5 verse 3 and 4 talks about sexual sin now sexual sin is a massive cause of bitterness because people enter into sexual sin thinking that there's love involved, there's a commitment, there's a future, there's a hope. And when it turns sour, then there's bitterness left. So it says, uh, it talks in Proverbs chapter 3, it talks about, um, Proverbs chapter 5 rather, it talks about uh, sexual sin being sweet as honey, or smooth as oil, sweet as honey at the beginning, but the end is bitter. So I find many people are bitter, usually it's women, because they were conned by some man who lied to them about loving them, took advantage of their emotional vulnerability, and then they felt cheated and ripped off when they found he was a liar and just abandoned them afterwards. So deep bitterness can come there. It can work both ways as well. So um, in Jeremiah 3 and verse 15, It talks about Rachel being very bitter or grieving bitterly because of the loss of her children. So abortion, miscarriage, the death of a child can cause deep bitterness to come into people's lives. There's many causes, unlimited causes, of course. But it just gives you, these give you a few examples in the Bible of people who became very, very bitter. So um, how how does the bitterness affect people? So how does it affect people that we saw already? Uh, Number one, uh, bitterness, Hebrews 12, 15, it, it, it defiles the relationships. So what happens is when people are bitter, they speak with a sharpness. And their sharpness wounds and hurts people. Talks in Proverbs about bitter words that pierce like a sword. Bitter words. So if you listen to people speak, if they're bitter, you will hear it in the sound and tone of the voice. It literally comes because it's sharp. And so when people are like that, you tend to be on edge when you're around them because their words are cutting. You hear cutting words, that's a bitter person. It's showing up in the words. The words reveal what kind of spirit we have, what kind of thing. Second thing about bitterness is it grieves the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 4 and verse 30, again, uh, verse 20, talking then about, verse 30, sorry, talking about uh, the way we communicate. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but rather that which is good to the use of edifying. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't let any bitterness and hatred and so on get into your heart. So bitterness will grieve the Holy Spirit. It quenches the move of God in your life. So when people are bitter, there's very little flow of anointing around their life. There's very little flow of God. You can come to church, you can pray to all kinds of stuff, but you must resolve what's in the heart because it will grieve the Spirit of God who loves the people that you're so bitter and angry against. Hey, a lot in this, isn't there? Here's another one. Bitterness will open the door to demonic spirits. Bitterness, will it's like an open door. So I notice in Malaysia... I was there, and they had these doors, and they had not only a door that you locked, they also had a gated door, like, like iron bars, and they had a padlock on the iron bar. And they go, how do you ever get out of the place? And I, and, and I asked them, and I said, oh, it's because we have a real brief problem here, people breaking into the house. So it would be unthinkable to leave the doors open at night because a thief would come in. 
So in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 34, 35, Matthew 18, 34, 35, Jesus said, if you won't forgive your brother from your heart, everyone that trespasses, then it says you'll be delivered to tormentors. In other words, permission takes place in the spirit world for spirits to enter your life. So you find when people harbor unforgiveness and let it grow into bitterness, they're tormented. They can't stop thinking about the injustices. They, co they think about injustices. They notice injustices. It's like they, they just can pick up that people are doing things wrong all the time because their whole inner life is now tuned in to listen to the voice of spirits. Now, if you say, uh, have you got demons? People say no. But you actually find out when you've set, set them free all the noise in their head stopped, the, the, the voices of the spirits, the reminders of their pain, the reminders of the injustice, all that stuff just gone because the spirits have gone. Not only that, when spirits come in because of bitterness, inevitably sickness comes as well. So the, these, are the, these are the terrible fruit that this, that, that, uh, that this does. Uh, another uh, is that it, um, it produces a victim mindset, which you can see in here. It says of the people of God, they complained. Well, what can we do? You know, there's God, you know, and you've led us here. And so the, it produces, bitterness produces a victim mindset because focusing on injustice, you see yourself as being treated unfairly and the mindset is, I've been treated unfairly. That's a victim mindset. It's a mindset that blames people. And so we'll look at the fruit, uh, how, how it shows up in just a moment. But the people of God had a victim mentality. Bitterness keeps you in a victim state. You stay angry. You stay uh, uh, the, the recipient of injustice. And I've suffered. And I've heard all this stuff. So you actually, your identity becomes that of a victim rather than, actually, I'm a conqueror. This is who I am. That's who I used to be. Now I'm someone different. I'm an overcomer. When I come into places, the light shines because I'm bringing the light in there. See, I've called to bring freedom. But you see, if you've got bitterness inside you, you may come to church, but you're never in the flow of God because the flow of God requires my spirit be free of bitterness that I walk in love. If you grieve the Holy Spirit, how are you going to be empowered? How, how are you going to overcome? How are you going to walk in the power of God? How, could, how can you do it if the one who helps you, you're hurting him and grieving him and he's hiding from you all the time? It, it, we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit, to cause them sorrow and distress and grief. Otherwise, we don't live a powerful life. We tend to live like a victim, which, ah, oh, well, you know, it happens to me. It's like oh, you can almost feel the bitterness. You can feel it in the way people talk sometimes. That their thinking is like, I'm out, the life is out to get me. You know, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't think, they, I can't, can't trust anyone. So there's lots of people around like that now. Lots of people. And so the people of God coming out of Egypt still had the bitterness in their hearts, still felt and thought like victims. We can't do that. God requires us to be responsible. You're not responsible for what someone else does. You're responsible for you and how you overcome. And God gives you grace to choose, to forgive, to bless, and to overcome, and to stay joyful in the face of injustice. Be a witness that God's power is real. It does transform. It does cause you to overcome. Yeah. <laughs> What do you reckon, eh? Here's another thing that bitterness will produce. It'll produce envy of others. You start to notice what everyone else is getting. Whoa, James 3, verse 14 and 15, it talks about bitter envying. So, so bitterness that I've had it hard, I've got it tough, produces also envying of what others have. All right for you, you come from a good family. See, the bit, that's the, you know, all right for you, you've got good education. You think... Well, what kind of whiny loser thinking is that? Well, really, really. And that's, and that's perpetuated in our culture, that people blame the background as being the reason why you can't do something. No, it isn't at all. It's the thinking and the bitterness is the reason you're defeated in life. 
it's important. The, the key to victory is not to look back at all the things that we've gone through and remain a victim. The key to it is to realize God is with me. He chose, he's my healer. He wants to reveal himself as my healer. He wants to empower me to enter the blessings he's planned for me. See, God had planned blessing. They couldn't see that. All they can see is the bitterness. That's what bitterness does. It blinds you. Another thing bitterness does, it produces cycles of failure and defeat. Because when pe people are bitter, they make judgments like this. Oh, I never trust a man. You know, a man will always do this to you. Whoa, what kind of bitterness is that? And it's not all men are like that. Maybe one was, and maybe some others are, but not everyone. At least Jesus isn't. See? But if you've got that mentality, you will attract into your life only that kind of person. You'll only see that. You'll be like a magnet for it. Isn't it crazy? Oh, I never trust a woman, they'll try and control you. Oh, really? Well, I'm sure you're not doing too well in the woman area, you know, because what will happen is you'll attract in the very thing you believe. That's what goes on. So people say, oh, I'll never, I'll never marry anyone like my dad. Oh, really? You can't believe how many times I've counseled people who married, or what? if he wasn't like your dad before, he's turned into him now. Because the bitterness is to father the relationship. Okay. I'll never be like my mum. I'll never be like my dad. Listen, all of that flows out of bitterness and ensures that the cycle repeats. So if you've got cycles of failure, always look, are there roots of bitterness driving it? Is there something somewhere where I've made a judgment, I've formed a bitterness in my heart that I need to face and forgive and release to break the cycle so I can choose differently? I, I spoke to someone the other day, and they said, I have recognized cycles of defeat. I said, find where the first defeat was, and you'll get a good idea where this thing all started. I think you'll find it'll be back in your family, with a father, with a mother, with an injustice of some kind. And instead of having the grace of God to resolve it, you chose to become bitter. If you chose to become bitter, you can choose differently now. Okay? Bitterness is a choice how I respond. Nurture and hold offense and hurt and anger, allow resentment to start to come. Soon bitterness is there because you chose to let it grow. But the victim mindset will desperately want to blame someone else for my misery. You know people like that? Oh, we know heaps of people like that. And so instead of being powerful people, they're victim people. Oh, well, no, I always like this. Never worked out for me. Oh, really? It never worked out for you? Not even once? Something's going on in your life. You've got a cycle of defeat. So we need to recognize those kind of things. So how many, and of course, bitterness will affect your health. You, you, you have all kinds of issues come. So how are we going to find out that we've got bitterness in our heart when we don't recognize it too easily? Well, one, the Holy Spirit can reveal it. He can just talk to you. I remember one day I was kneeling by my bed praying and I'd been to a seminar and they talked about bitter roots. And while I'm praying, the Lord said, you are holding bitterness against your wife. This is when you did it. It just took me right back to the very moment when I hardened my heart instead, because I was so hurt instead of forgiving. And he said, ever since then, there's been a hardness in you towards her emotionally. You need to repent. See, so the Holy Spirit can tell us so I, I said, honey, God's just spoken to me that I've been held bitterness from that point, and then this happened and so on. Instead of forgiving and letting it go, I got hard. Please forgive me. And she began to cry, and she, said, and she said, I've been bitter against you for this reason. And so we both knelt down, and we both repented and wept and, and asked God's forgiveness and forgave one another. And there was a shift immediately in our relationship, immediately. So the Holy Spirit can reveal it. Circumstances God allows to happen in your life can reveal it as you see your response. When you see your responses to certain situations, then you can tell if there's bitterness there and uh, you'll hear it in your words or so on. So you can recognize bitterness. I can see it quite easily in people now because it shows up in a whole number of ways. And the main thing I've got to make sure is that if it's in me, that I pick it up quickly and deal with it. Someone else's bitterness is their issue, not mine. I just got to make sure I don't get hurt. Don't, don't react to it, you know? Okay then, so, so how, how do you recognize that bitterness is over? Now, I'm going to share with you a number of ways that it manifests. 
And, and if you recognize these, you then ask the question then, oh Lord, I'm doing that kind of thing. What is driving that? Is there something in my heart? Is there something you want to sort out with me today? And uh, maybe uh, as, you, as I list these symptoms, you'll recognize other people as well, because it's everywhere. I find it, it's just so frequently, I find I can just pick it up. So you notice with the people of Israel that they complain. So here's the kinds of things. Negativity, negativity. When people's prevailing attitude is negative, that's bitterness driving that. Uh, second thing is complaining, complaining. You find someone who's complaining, always complaining. You know someone like that? Always complaining. Yeah, they're bitter. That's why they're complaining. Israel complained. Israel were negative. Well, what are you doing? Oh, leaders out here are going to die out in the wilderness. No. It's kind of all this sort of bitter expectation of abuse. There was no confidence in God's loving leadership because all authorities had abused them for, for hundreds of years. So their, their mentality was against all forms of authority. So how can you live in the kingdom of God if you've got bitterness towards all forms of authority? How can you function when what's required is to honor the authority of God and respect the people he appointed? How can you function if you're bitter against authority figures in the past to abuse you? That's what Israel had their trouble. They couldn't enter the land because ultimately they couldn't trust or well, they refuse to trust. So uh, another way that um, bitterness shows up in a person's life, it usually shows up in the countenance. It really does show up in the countenance. And, and not so much earlier on in life, but, although it does then, but it does later on. Because as you get older, you tend to just let it show more. When you're younger, you tend to hide it. You know, but when you get older, it shows. It's like a, the, the, ma the corners of the mouth go down. Like that. I've seen people like that. You see them, they're like a bitterness. It affects the countenance. The countenance goes sour like they've been sucking lemons. I've seen people, the older people particularly, that have got like that. And you think, whoa, are you sucking a lemon or something? What has happened to you? Well, really, they have been for a long time. And now it's just now, it's, it's now showing on the countenance. See, joy in the heart will show in the countenance. Bitterness will eventually show as well. Now, sometimes you just catch it on someone's face. They'll be smiling, pretending everything's okay. They turn away and you suddenly see it. There it is. It shows, if you're a spirit person, a sensitive, you'll notice the stuff. And then you realize they're conning me. They're really bitter and they'll turn on me at some point. So you just know, so you know, how, to, you just know how to deal with that kind of stuff. So complaining. Yeah, blaming is another one. When people blame... A person who blames has got a, a bitter victim mindset. They were blaming someone else. Oh, not my fault. And complaining about this and blaming this one and blame the government. Well, the government's in my life. Well, listen, the government, you elected them, so just get over it. You know, the Bibles just say, pray for them, and that's it. Pray for them, honor them, and then that's it. That's all God asks you to do. And say you to say, well, I know better than them. If I was the idea, no, you're not there, and it's not your job. Just pr do what God says to do. See, that's what's called submitting to the authority of God. He says it's none of your business, it's none of your business. Don't go ramping on and, and, and being bitter and complaining and blaming and all that kind of stuff. Just reach into God for power to win in life. If your source is God, the resources are unlimited. If your source is men, then you've got a lot of reason to complain and blame because you're not going to get through. <laughs> so people blame their lack of education they blame their parents they blame their school they blame this blame that listen when you blame you're a victim you just cannot get out of the hole until you stop the blame and take ownership what can I do to move my life forward now many people are like this I, I, I taught in high schools I have many people come in and already they're in the failure mode for life so my main thing was not to just teach them a topic, but to help them shift their thinking about it, that they could do this, they could make a go of it, they could be a winner, that the possibility of having a different future was very real. See, otherwise you become cynical and bitter, and then there's no passion for God, no hunger for God, there's no seeking of God, there's a lack, of, it's just like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Same, same, as they say in Indonesia. <laughs> So um, a lack of joy is always an evidence of bitterness, lack of joy. And bitter, bitter people can't be joyful. But I think, man, a, you know, a merry heart does good like a medicine. 
but a broken spirit that dries the bones so people who are broken or bitter inside they have all kinds of problems and they they never look happy never look joyful I say I come into church sometimes think what is wrong with you you should be why aren't you the happiest people the kingdom of heaven is righteousness peace and joy the Holy Ghost gives where's the Holy Ghost oh we grieved him oh okay and we grieve them over the way we treat people. It's in the relational area and the character area that the grief takes place. And that's what robs you of the life. God, works. God wants us just to live in a joy that he's with us, to enjoy every day, enjoy what's around us, experience his goodness all the time. But if you're bitter, you can't see good. Bitter people can't see good. They can't see good. They're blinded by the bitterness. They can't see good. Good comes, and so they can't see it. And so another thing about bitter people is they're never thankful. They're never thankful. They get entitled. So you do something for them, they never say thank you. I cannot get over this. How people will just take generosity, take kindness, and never say thank you. What is wrong with you? Thank you. Say thank you. Thank you is the way you build good relationships. How does God tell us to come into his presence? Oh, come and saying thank you. So even God is attracted when we thank him and honor him. He says that's how you come near to him. So how much more in human relationships if we put that into practice, so to thank people and smile at them. You get, them, get on the check, a check out of a, of, a, of a supermarket, smile at the lady and say, thank you for serving me today. And then make her day. You watch the face suddenly light up and they come alive and they look after you. And you think, what happened? I just brought life into their day. Thanking them. Bitter people aren't thankful, they're entitled. Yeah, yeah uh, so they lack gratitude. So uh, bitter people uh, make judgments. Well, you never do this for me. You never do. I never get anything like that. So they've all got that kind of judgments, you know. In all men. <laughs> and uh, bitter people, um, usually they envy and they have ambition and they strive for power. So I find people in church frequently will strive for recognition, strive for a position put anyone down to get there that is bitterness at work demonic hard to see because they know usually what the right things are to say and do but after you've been around a few years you get to see it and uh it's it's a sad thing very sad thing so when a person is bitter what i find is after a while they don't know who they're bitter at they're just bitter at everything they're just they're negative about everything uh, have you ever met someone like that I can't I remember being in a cafe one time and I heard this farmer and his wife talking. Every time he opened his mouth, he was complaining about something. In the end, I got the giggles. I started to laugh because every time he opened his mouth, there was something else he's complaining about. I thought, how could someone have so much to complain about? And we started to laugh. I started to get the giggles. We got the joy of the Lord. In the end, we were just having hysterics. And not laughing at him, but just, just the whole thing of just so, so much negativity. And then... The anointing of the Holy Ghost came, and then he began to laugh, and he just forgot about all his troubles. So, see, God causes us to forget the sorrows. You know, Joseph named one of his sons. God has, forgot, has caused me to forget my sorrows. Manasseh caused me to forget my sorrows. God has helped me to overcome the sorrows I've gone through and brought joy into my life. That's what God wants to do, and, and, and he, he can do it. It's just we need to process stuff his way. So we need to be free of bitterness. Huh? Free of bitterness. Free of bitterness. How many recognize some of that? You recognize it. It's, it and we get it. And it can be over many things. I have many reasons to be bitter. I could give you a lot of reasons to be bitter. I remember struggling with bitterness towards God. At one point when we discovered that one of our daughters had been raped. And what got me so upset was... I felt that I'd prayed and kept my family in God, put God first, all that kind of thing. How could such a thing happen? So I was very angry at God and didn't want to talk to him, didn't talk to him, which is a bit difficult if you're a pastor. <laughs> so we had very limited conversation for a little while. I'm trying to preach on Sundays and I'm crying on the way to church. And uh, so I would just weep on the way to church because of the grief and the sorrow and what we were going through. And as I get near the church, I said, now God, your people I expect you to front up and help me right now overcome my struggles and just to preach a good message then we'll talk about this stuff later and the moment I cross into the into the property the tears would all go the presence of God would come and preach everyone get blessed I will drive out 
and I'd barely driven 100 meters. Oh! <laughs> so, so I had to wrestle with the issue that I was struggling with God to trust him and to let go. So one day someone said to me, I asked, hey, what do I do with this? You know, I don't know what to do. They said, well, why don't you, what do you want to say to God? And why don't you just say it? <laughs> why don't I just say it? I never thought of that one. So I just said it. And, and it just came out. I just let go. <laughs> and there was a silence. I thought, he heard that. And then he spoke to me really clearly. And so it was like having got out of my heart. And I, I just said, I don't know why I even bothered to pray now. I don't really want to pray because I prayed and this happened. I just feel like this is a waste of time for me to do this. It's a bit of a struggle place to be if you're a pastor in the day. Anyway, it was a bit of a low spot in the history. And uh, there were the water of Marah. There we are again. <laughs> Something's coming up. And the Lord spoke and said, when you pray, you're not praying aright. I was shocked. What, what do you mean? And he said, I, he said, I am not committed to your comfort. I'm committed to your character. He said, sometimes I will permit things to happen because I know what I can do to change your character and shift you and create a testimony in your life. I was just wept and wept and wept. And then he said one other thing. He said, you know how you're feeling as a father with your daughter right now and what's happened to her? He, and I said, yes, I, I'm really feeling grieved at how she's been defiled and affected by this. He said, that's how I feel about my people when demonic spirits enter and defile them. And I, I just cried and cried, but it was not angry at God. It was like God was my friend who understood the difficulty. And we were sharing the grief, a shared experience. So sometimes the difficult situation you go through brings a deep experience with God and a knowledge of God that you would never have had any other way. And God came and intervened and did a miracle and totally restored her supernaturally. Everything shifted around just like that. But it required I overcome the deep bitterness. And it wasn't just about that event. I realized that growing up with religion, there had been a bitterness against God and a, and a feeling of powerlessness. And it had never left until that day when I repented of it and got rid of it. So I can share other stories, but we've got enough now. Just share the simple keys of coming out of all of this is, is, um, is, if we just look in the story, just finish with the story of Moses, and you'll see the simple key that's in there. It's really quite amazing. And when I looked at the story, I just, I just wept as I saw how amazing this is. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 15. Remember it says, the people complained. See, in their bitterness, they all complained. But it says, the, Moses cried out to the Lord. So when you come and face a bitter situation in life, your choice is to complain or cry out to the Lord. That's the choice. You can either cry out to God for help, or you can become embittered by what you're walking through. And if you become embittered, then you become a little harder in your heart, and it affects your relationships, your ability to trust. And uh, so... It says, Moses cried out to the Lord, and when he cried out to the Lord, God showed him a provision that had always been there and was God's provision for them all the time. He said, the Lord showed him a tree that when you put the tree in the waters, then the bitter became sweet. So that, that's, of course, a prophetic picture of the cross of Calvary, that at the cross, Jesus suffered rejection, suffered trauma, took our griefs, took our sorrows. He did all of that. But it does no good to us unless we see the tree does that and put the tree into the pain of our experiences. So by faith, we apply what Christ has done. If I see that at the cross, Jesus took my sorrow, took my grief, took my injustices, took my bitterness, I can acknowledge them and bring them to the cross. The cross will only take away what you acknowledge. So as Christians, often we deny the pain. 
we minimize the pain, we pretend it's easier or better than it is, when in fact actually there's immense grief and immense pain. And so if we, the Lord showed him a tree. He showed him the cross. Now the tree was always there. He just couldn't see it. The cross has always been there to empower you to overcome, yet we just didn't see it. But it's never too late, you see, because now as you see that the cross, at the cross, Jesus exchanged, he took all our bitterness and grief and resentment and anger and hurt and pain. He took it so we could be free. So that means I can come in faith to him. I can acknowledge the pain and the anger and the bitterness. I can then choose to receive forgiveness from him and forgive those who've hurt me. That's why Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them. We need to forgive. Forgiveness is absolutely crucial. From the heart, we forgive. So we must make that decision that we will release forgiveness from the heart. And that if there's judgments we've made, break the judgments and claim freedom from the bitterness. Now, I had a really interesting experience with this in Singapore. Man, I'd never seen anything like this. It was only it was about two years ago. And uh, we were teaching on forgiveness, and I felt the Lord say, now teach on forgiveness, what it is, what it's not, how to forgive. And I told people, I want you, first of all, because Jesus said, forgive from the heart. To forgive from the heart means you don't, more than saying a prayer, to forgive from the heart means you acknowledge the pain and injustice and surrender it to the Lord and then release forgiveness, let the debt go. But if you don't acknowledge the pain, then it's only head, head forgiveness. It doesn't really affect, it doesn't t have effect. So I said, this is what I want you to do. Tonight when you go home, I want you to write a letter. It's an anger letter. Because most of these young people had problems with their parents, you see. So, so what I said, now what you're going to do is you're going to write a letter, one to dad, one to mom. You're never going to send it. The letter is an anger letter to bring back tomorrow to bring resolution to the pain you have. So I said, do not show them, do not send it to anyone. It's a private thing between you and God. Not even I'm going to see it. It's to help you get out of your heart what is going on in your heart. So I said, you write the letter. Now, with the difficulty with parents is because of loyalty to parents and desire to honor parents, it's hard to acknowledge what really happened because we keep flipping out from this is what happened to actually they're not that bad. So I said, this is what you do. You write down... Dear Dad, and write down a list and honor him for everything that you can think of. List everything you're thankful that he provided until there's no more to, to write, and then thank him for all those things. Then turn the page, because good and evil are together. People are broken. So now write down the other things that happened and the effect it had and how you feel about it. Just write honestly. Just, it's in your heart. God knows it's in your heart. You're not admitting it. This is your chance to admit it, what you really feel and how deeply you really feel and how it's affected you. Put it down. So when you put it down, just write it from your heart. Don't try and work it out for your head. Write it from your heart. There's no more to write. And now have a look at it. That is what you're carrying that you're going to let go. That's what you're forgiving and releasing. So write words of release. And when you come tomorrow, I said, bring your letter. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a faith action. We're going to stand at the front. And this is what you'll do. You'll have your letter in your hand, which has got the pain and all the stuff, that the injustice and whatever. And I said, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to release forgiveness. And when we pray for you, I want you to let go of the piece of paper and we'll pray and break the power of tormenting spirits off your life. Fear and bitterness and hatred, all the stuff that goes on. And uh, I said, okay, here it is. So we got them all lined up. Oh, man, there were 300 of them. It's just hundreds of them just lined up there, got their letter in front of them like that. And, uh, you know, tears are there and the presence of God was there. And so I led them in a prayer and that was great. And the music was playing. And so I got the first one, took the thing, took out his hand. And the power of God hit him and he got set free. Took the second one, the power of God boosh, hit him like that. Got to a girl, I, I took the thing and she wouldn't let it go. And I pulled on it and she pulled back. There's a tug of war going on like this. And, and the, Lord said, the Lord spoke to me. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I want to get the letter off of you. Know? And he said, that's what bitterness looks like. That's what unforgiveness looks like. Refusal to let go. Even though she's acknowledged it, she's still refusing to let it go. She wants to hold on to her anger and her bitterness. You cannot make her let go. She must choose. So I had to stop trying to pull the paper out of it. Isn't that ridiculous? I know it is, but stuff happens, you know. So anyway, so I said, honey, I can't take this from you. You have to let it go. It's your choice to forgive. 
If you choose to forgive, you'll be delivered. If you don't, I can't help you. She chose to let it go. The moment she let go, Paragon, boof, hit her like that. She was set free and delivered and cried and just immediately set free. I've been amazed how many times that happened in that crowd. And the Lord just showed me. He like gave me a revelation for the first time of people holding on to the issue, refusing to let it go. And he said, you, they, they have to make that choice. Uh, and one or two, the bit, they were so gripped by demons of bitterness, the Lord spoke to me, said, you need to command the spirit to, to let them go. And then when I did that and they were delivered, then they could let go of the paper. So a spirit caused them or contributed to them holding on so deeply to the hatred and anger. So how do we get free? The Lord led them to a place where their bitterness was exposed and he showed a tree, the cross, which when you put the cross into the waters or if by faith you bring the sorrows and disappointments to the Lord and release forgiveness and repent of harboring the bitterness, then you can be free. And they were healed. And God said, I, he gave revelation. I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. God is the healer. Now notice what happened straight after that, straight after that, after they let go, straight after that, there are all of these wells, 12 wells and 70 palm trees, speaking of God's perfect provision for them as they come under his order and governance. It's an amazing prophetic picture in the Bible. But it's not just for them, it's for us. That we too can walk for many years being bitter, angry, harboring unforgiveness and grief and sorrow and never let it go. But when we become aware of it, we now have a choice. Will I hold it? Will I reach out for the grace of God and become sweet? Will I let God sweeten me? Now to be sweetened is more than just forgiving. Sweetening involved that I now begin to bless the people that hurt me. Jesus said, pray, bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you. How do I pray for them? God, get them! No, 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 no. No, no you just can see that that's not quite the right spirit there. You haven't really let go, you know? It, it's, see that whole injustice? Said, this is how you pray. You just hold them before the Lord, Father, I just pray and release your blessing. Father, I thank you for them. Today, I choose again to forgive them. Today, I choose to bless them in Jesus' name. Now, the Bible says that God came to Israel to bless them and turning them away from their sins. So what we're saying is, God, I leave it to you to deal with and address them. I'm praying you will bless them. Turn them away from the things that have caused these behaviors. It's as simple as that. And they don't need to pray a lot, but I found it's really important. You know you've gone from death to life when love is in your heart. You're free. So it's not just a matter of saying, I forgive. That's not going to do it. No, you're still, you're still angry and bitter inside. You need to have a sweet spirit. It doesn't mean you trust the person. It doesn't mean the relationship's restored. It means you've become sweet, no longer sour and bitter. And you actually, when you think about them, you're not getting angry anymore. So what it does require is that I encounter God and let my pain and grief go and choose to forgive and choose to receive forgiveness. And secondly, after that, on a daily basis, I found what helped me was every day I would just stand and Lord, I bring this person to you. I choose to forgive them today. Father, I bless them. I pray your hand to come upon them to help them in life until my heart was free. And after that, it didn't affect me. So now, pretty well on a daily basis, this is how I would pray. Father, today I commit my walk before you today. I choose to walk in the spirit of forgiveness today. Whatever comes before me today, I choose to reach out for your grace and forgive. I will not walk in offense or bitterness. So it's a lifestyle, not just I just need to get fixed up because I'm angry about someone. It's actually choosing to walk in a different spirit. God is kind to the just and the unjust. We're to represent him, be his sons and daughters. You see, some are struggling with that right away. Because the injustice of what we've suffered, we just can't, we don't want to get over it. Well, you can stay in injustice, or you can bring injustice to the injustice of the cross. You can bring your grief to the cross. You can bring your pain to the cross. But what about them? No, no, listen. Let them go to let God sort them out. 
You, you let go judging and leave judging to God. You, you actually no longer are the judge. You're here just to bless people. You're here to bless people and walk in the spirit of love. Now, it's a choice to walk in that. And when you walk that way, your life's free. The joy of the Lord is around your life. Instead of being depressed and oppressed and down and sorry for yourself and uh, operating in all kinds of things, there's a bit of people manipulate and control and do all kinds of weird stuff. And you don't want to be like that. We want to be, we want to be free. Now, some of the stuff will be from your family. Think about it. I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost to start to reveal things and we're going to have a time to pray for people. Some of it may be from a marriage. Some of it may be with your children. Some of it may be in a church experience. Church experiences can be horrendous. When it's going wonderfully, it's going wonderfully. But if a conflict happens and people, instead of holding their rank and their position, start to let bitterness flow, it poisons people. And innocent people get caught up in it. Often they, they get hurt deeply by it. They hear stories. And if you're a leader, one of the challenges of being a leader is you can't defend yourself. You can't say words to explain all that you know. So you just can't do that. So in our journey, we're faced on a number of situations where I've had to cover the bad behavior of people or not actually say it out loud to people. Just to keep it, I just had no voice to say anything about it. We just had to let God work it all out. But for the people who are in the church, you can be deeply defiled by the issues that other people did not get grace from God to cope with. And it's a problem. And so it may be for some of you, you're wrestling with that. And that's, it's, a very, it's a very challenging thing because if we become bitter, uh, we don't trust anymore. And that means our future is affected. So I believe that God wants to help us to get free of bitterness, help us to get free of the demonic spirits that get around us because bitter people become infested with bitterness, unforgiveness, with anger, with grief, often with witchcraft because they're trying to manipulate and control everything, uh, with fear because they're afraid of what may happen. God wants us to be free of all of that stuff. But we have to choose. So come on, just close your eyes right now. I'm going to have an altar call in just a moment for people to be free of injustice, free of uh, bitterness, free of uh, grief and anger from what's happened to them in the past, free from things, the fear of these things happening again. So right now, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come. Father, we bring before you our background, our lives are before you right now. You are the God who heals. So, Father, we ask you, would you show us, is there an unresolved issue from our background with our Father that you want to heal and deliver us from tonight, today? Lord, just show us that right now, just a moment of time. Lord, do we, is there an issue with a mother that's just been sitting there for many, many years of what she did, what she didn't do? Uh, Lord, if there's an issue there, of bitterness and judgments and vows that we've made. Lord, show us right now. Lord, is there some injustice we've gone through uh, with our peers growing up? Is there some injustice we suffered at school, being falsely accused, falsely treated, wrongly treated, being ganged up on, being isolated, rejected, being uh, humiliated by teachers, being humiliated by peers? Is there something we need to forgive and let go of? Lord, is there something in our work life treated unjustly, treated wrongly, criticized wrongly, judged wrongly, you know, treated and lied against, Lord, that we need to let go of? Is there something that's happened in a church experience? We've suffered in a church experience, been caught up with the defilement around other people, with their problem. It was never our problem, but it became our problem, and now we're quite hurt and angry with it, and we don't trust anymore. We've drawn back. We're no longer walking boldly and confidently forward. We've drawn back. Father, is there any area that you're wanting us to be clean and free of right now? Has there been a relationship with some of the opposite sex and we thought it was going to be just the wonderful thing, the journey of the life, and it turned out to be some bitter, horrendous experience that we need to be set free of? Lord, just show us those situations. Lord, have we looked into sexual relationships and other things to gain some level of happiness and satisfaction and ended up cheated and bittered by it? Lord, just show us right now. Lord, is there any place that the fruits of bitterness are showing in our life that we need to repent of? Complaining and blaming, anger, envy, judging, never seeing the good, always expecting the wrong. 
feeling like a victim and powerless. Lord, if we embraced a victim mindset and now we need to repent of playing the victim identity and choose to embrace that I'm a son or daughter of the living God empowered to overcome in life. Lord, what is the issue? What is the area? Lord, just show us in a moment of time and Lord, we choose to respond. We choose to respond by believing you've paid the price for us to be free. We choose to respond by acknowledging the grief and pain and bringing the injustice of it all to the cross. We choose to respond by repenting, asking your forgiveness for harboring these things for so long. We choose to release forgiveness, letting go all judgments against people. And we choose, Lord, today to start to bless the people that have hurt us, pray for those who've used us, and to walk in freedom. Father, I thank you for speaking to people today. Why don't we just stand right now and this just come to the front. You know, if God's been speaking to you or not, you know what the issue is and who the person is. You know what it is that God's wanting you to be free of. If you're watching online or watching on a DVD somewhere, then uh, God wants to touch you and help you there as well. You can make a response. And the very prayer we pray here will touch you wherever you are. So it's just come. It's just come. Lift your hands to the Lord right now. Lift your hands to the Lord. And begin to worship him if you need to grieve just it's okay to grieve it's okay to cry as you think about those situations often that's when the grief comes so let's just open our hearts to the Lord some of you may find at a later time you may want in the privacy of your home to do an anger letter or something like that just to actually properly process the feelings and what you carry so in the meantime why don't we just begin to quietly pray in the spirit just begin to worship the Lord Worship the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the cross. Well, we thank you today. You have opened our eyes to see that at the cross, Jesus carried our sorrows. He carried our sufferings. He carried our rejection. He carried our injustices. He carried the abuse. He carried every aspect of how we have suffered so we would not carry it any longer. We would be free. Lord, we come to you in faith, believing Christ has paid the price for our freedom and we choose to reach out to you to become free. Lord, we choose right now. So let's just pray in the Spirit for a little. Pray in the Spirit. If you're watching online, just pray in the Spirit for a little. Begin to worship the Lord. Let your heart open up to him. As you think about the people, the person, whatever's happened, just allow the grief to come to the surface. Allow it to just come to the surface. The injustice that you felt, the pain that you felt. Make the decision, I choose to forgive each person. I choose to release them today. I choose to break free of the bitterness by the grace of God. Just make that decision in your heart. Then in a moment, what I'm going to do is lead you in a prayer. And that prayer is to break your agreement with the bitterness. A prayer to bring these things to the cross. A prayer to forgive. And as you do it, do it from your heart. Let go genuine, authentically. I let go the debt. I let go the injustice. I let go trying to cope with it, and I lean into the Holy Spirit. After we've prayed through a prayer together, I'll just then pray a general prayer over everyone, and then we'll come and lay hands on people for an impartation and for you to be set free of spirits of bitterness. When we come to lay hands on you, stop praying. Just whatever's there, just breathe it out. Let it come out of your life. I'm ready now. Some of you, it may be your father, some a mother, some a family member, some an injustice in finances, some an injustice in a relationship, some at school, some at church. Whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. This is between you and God. What matters is you let go and release forgiveness. Choose to cancel the debt. Let the person go. You're not going to raise it again. For you, this is being, letting it go to the cross. Already just follow me in this prayer. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, you love me, that you provided on the cross for me to be set free. Today I confess I've held bitterness and unforgiveness in my heart. Lord, today I repent of this. I bring the grief and sorrow to you. I bring the injustice to you. And I choose to forgive from my heart each person who hurt me. I forgive them, I release them, I ask that you bless them. And today, Lord, I ask you set me free. I renounce all bitter judgments. 
I renounce all inner vows. I break all agreement with bitterness. And I claim deliverance now. I speak to every evil spirit. I command you to go from my life. Go from my life. Fear, bitterness, anger, hatred. Go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Now let's begin to worship the Lord together. This is keep praying. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I break now the spirit of injustice. I come against spirits of bitterness, hatred, fear, spirits of abuse, spirits of witchcraft, envy. I command you, go in Jesus' name. I break soul ties to people that traumatize you. I break soul ties and attachments to people who betrayed and hurt you. I break it off your life. I command the defilement now to loose from your life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I keep praying. Let's just keep praying and worshiping the Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's some people to come and just be behind people. So as we pray for them, Father, right now, I thank you for the power of your anointing. Be loosed in Jesus' name right now. Let them go right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Touch, touch, loose in Jesus' name.